Okay, this is a reading from the book Wounded Deer and Centaurs, final chapter, titled Funny God, the Cosmic Overstanding. Our deepest compassionate human nature abhors the murder implicit in an echo side. It's all in you and up to you. Now, dear reader, this is a chapter where I set all of this, all this pre-perinatal psychology and activism, inside a metaphysical framework which adds immeasurably to our understanding of both thrusts of this book, the consciousness expanding and the activism encouraging. This is the final chapter where, where I will give you the best stuff, shake you by the hand or give you a fist bump, and pat you on the back, slap you on the butt, go get him, champ, as I send you out the door to be your own raging maniac of change, hope, and planetary and planet-made survival. Funny God. Last year, 2015, I published my book, Funny God, The Tao of Funny God and the Mind's True Liberation. Briefly, it is a macrocosmic look at our times and our challenges. It is the highest overstanding of our situation. Some of its ideas are relevant here as well. Still, some of its notions might seem at odds with what is being said here. I can easily see that someone who would understand the idea put forth there, that we and all life are essentially immortal, for they, we, are all aspects of a one consciousness, a one experience, which has no beginning or end and which only changes and transforms, might wonder then at why we should at all be concerned with this dying off of life on our planet. One might be tempted to cop a pseudo-spiritual or transpersonal stance to bolster one's dark forces of denial and complacency and might feel that my work supports such apathy, such cowardice. That is hardly the case, and here I will explain why. Heading God is Us. You say, funny God? God is funny? Well, I think there is something to that, to God being funny, as, as in having a sense of humor, which I get into in other places. The main point I am making with funny God is that God's a trip, to put it in the vernacular. More accurately, God is funny because we're fallible. We're funny, and God is us. God is funny because we as God are pathetic, dramatic, foolish, forgetful, forgetful of our true nature as divinity, and more. We ape that we are intelligent, superior to nature, and transcendent to nature with our pretension of having the ability to reason. Yet, as I said in chapter 15 about the God's reaction to us as we continue our blind plummeting into an environmental abyss with the evidence of our mistaken ambitions all around us, they are no doubt laughing at us. Yes, we are ultimately God, but damn, we are funny as humans. You see, in addition to funny God, I wrote Experiences Divinity, 2013. For my experience and understanding, experience and understanding that is not that uncommon in these psychedelic and mystical days, the highest truth that we can know is that we are all one, and that one is the all that is, and that all that is includes us. I mean, we say we are stardust. Well, like, so what? I mean, physically we are stardust, but the important thing about being stardust is that we are part of the universe. We are part of the reality of the universe. We are not separate trying to get to heaven. We are not separate trying to get to God. We are part of God. God is the all that is, and we are part of that. We are not above reality, looking down on it like the way, the way we imagine of that deity of ours, who we say we are not, yet act like we are in trying to control everything around us. No. We are not separate trying to get to heaven. We are not separate trying to get to God. We are part of God. God is the all that is, and we are part of that. We are not above reality, looking down on it the way we imagine of that deity of ours, who we say we are not, yet act like we are in trying to control everything around us. No, big surprise, we are part of reality. And reality is the manifestation of God. It is God, seen from our diminished human perspective. Reality is not some separate machine-like thing with which a different thing, a god, sets in motion, adjusts, and repairs like some gigantic watchmaker in the sky, our misconceived and fraudulent religions have us thinking that we are separate from reality and separate from God, and that we have fallen. No, we are part of God, always have been, always will be. But what we have done is that we have forgotten that we are God. Consider how much we forget about our deeper human nature of cooperation and joy in the process of going through the prenatal, perinatal pain and trauma that I have delineated in this book. Now, consider that part of that pain, as well as even earlier trauma that I get into in Falls from Grace, 2014, has us forgetting our even deeper divine nature, actually identity, as well. Heading forgetting voluntary limitations make life fun. So I see reality in terms of funny gods and a funny God. Basically, God is funny because we, as God, each one of us, decided to forget that we are God so as to have a trip, the human trip. 
It's kind of like playing a game. You know, when you play a board game, you forget that the real world exists out there. You're playing Monopoly or whatever, and that's your reality for that moment. You have certain rules. And you are operating with other people, other entities. It is a back and forth kind of thing. Action and reaction, communication and response, play and counterplay. And it's fun. We are engaged in wanting to see what our opponents are going to do. What will be their next play? How will we react to it? But in order for it to be fun, we have to forget that it is not real, that there are no real or at least very important stakes. If it is a card game, we have to forget that we would we could walk over behind our opponent and look at the cards in their hand. We have to refrain from knowing their next play by staying on one side of the table. Those are the rules. Similarly, in the game of life, we have to forget that we know it all. We have to keep out of our mind while playing that there actually is no duality. There is no I and them. There is no time. That everyone is one, and all time is now, and all awareness is within us. We have to forget all that and pretend there are limitations and separations that we do not, indeed, know it all, including the next play. So we do. In a part of us which we again we have forgotten, we do. In this play of life, we know even what our opponents are going to do. Indeed, a part of us knows the entire script of our lives as well as everyone else's. But what fun is it to read a novel that you already know by heart whose ending is clear in your mind? No, it's not going to be fun if you know what their next play is going to be. So we know even what our fellow players, our other us's, are going to do, yet we have to limit ourselves in order to fully participate in the game, the experiment in truth that is each individual life, in order to enjoy it. And enjoying, despite all we have been told, is the essence of God, is our true essence, and is the only reason for existing and for existence itself. Let us take another analogy, that of a play. In this sense, being alive is like being an actor on a stage. So we are an actor on a stage playing a part, but we have forgotten that our divine nature is that we are everything and that we know that we are on a stage and all that is involved with that. A part of us knows that is the truth of our situation, but we block out that truth to better play our parts. Just like actual actresses and actors must consciously do to perform their parts. So that's, so that's what is funny God and why we're funny God and why God's funny. Remember that funny is fun is laughable, but also is odd or strange. That's a funny way of doing things, one might say. Something smells funny, that is strange or odd. Well, God is funny also, because we as God do a funny thing in creating life. We turn ourselves into beings who, especially human beings, forget who they are in order to make infinite stories and thereby glorify existence. And we invent time so as to better savor those stories. Just like a book contains all the narrative in its many pages, but we read through it over time, beginning to end, one sentence at a time, in a way that it is appreciated and the enjoyment of it magnified. More interesting that way, more enjoyable. Still, a funny thing for an all-knowing being to do, wouldn't you say? Next time I see God, I'll tell her, you became human, what a funny thing for you to do. Heading experiences divinity. Furthermore, funny God is the idea that what exists is pure consciousness, or is, what I call it, is experience. I stress this difference because consciousness is not something just mental. It's what we feel. It is all that we feel. When we have an experience, like in a breathwork experience or some other experience that we say is growthful, it is the entire feeling gestalt, including all mental, perceptual, emotional, and aware, and only somewhat aware components that we are talking about. All of life is just experience, and that experience overlaps with other people. I mean, all of us together is just one infinitely large ball of experience, yet we think we are separate. We have cordoned off separate areas of that, but those things of us, our experiences, they overlap and mix. That's why there is telepathy. That's why there are all those other things of the paranormal. That's why you can feel unity with other people, empathy, compassion, why their pains and joys can become yours. And ultimately, you can feel that unity with God. Because we are part of that all. Our boundaries can be like limited to our human form, or they can be expanded so as ultimately to include the all that is. So, so that's what funny God is. Funny God is about us, about the fact that we leave the Godhead for the fun of it. And why? Because it makes the whole even grander, more glorious. Knowledge by itself is just knowledge. It's not all that interesting. But knowledge plus time equals experience. And that's us. That's God become us. Being facetious, you might say that God, like myself, also does not believe there is much value in knowledge for its own sake. It holds that one must put it into action. We, as God, wanted to make everything greater 
for God is nothing if not the greatest. Apologies to Muhammad Ali, by the way, who will have to settle for just being good. So we forget, so as to create experience, as well as to manifest this incredible infinite variety of experience, which is God's grandeur. Heading, there is no death. Now, none of this, though mostly wrought of the discoveries coming from modern conscious research, is all that dissimilar from the spiritual literature, the stories you get out of India and so on, going back thousands of years. They tell of life and immortality and how we come into and out, into and out of life as in the blinking of an eye. They acknowledge our divine identity. Atman is Brahman is the way that is expressed, which is to say, I am that. In other words, our individual identity is commensurate with, is equal to, the all that is, or Brahman, or reality, or God. Like ancient quantum physicists, these wise scribes of long ago revealed to us that time is an illusion, that it is a construct, a mental thing that we concoct for reasons that have to do with our beingness as humans. Heading, breadcrumbs from ourselves as the divine. So in these tales, we are telling ourselves something. Our collective psyche, outside of time and space, comes through to remind us of our origins, our true nature, and the direction in which to go in order to remember that again and become one. There is something in us ever telling us, putting out like little breadcrumbs from the divine within us to show us the way home. It keeps putting out the information in every form around us, if we are watchful, if we are aware. Kind of like it gives us hints that this is the real truth. Here, look over here. It is like there are all these clues to tell us that we as God have put for us to tell us that this is all just an illusion. It is as illusory as any dream seems to us when we awaken at dawn. These clues say you're all just playing a game. You're each just having an experiment in truth. Every one of you is adding to the infinity of experience that is divinity and thereby magnified, indeed glorifying the all. More than that, you are each, by being forgetful of the all, creating actions, experiences, events that would not be possible without this game of duality and separateness. Thereby, you are bringing joy into it, enjoyment, bringing passion, emotion, and excitement and drama into it, making it interesting, bringing fun into it, making it funny, and bringing pain and separation into it, creating that beautiful pain of poignancy so as to better appreciate the joy, the fun, the pleasure, the love of it. We tell ourselves our true nature, even in the things we like to do, the things we invent, too. There are so many analogies I could use, so many breadcrumbs. For example, take amusement parks. You know, we go on a roller coaster or traipse through a haunted house, all the while knowing it is not real. The coaster is not really going to crash. There are no real ghosts in that house. So why do we do it? For fun. We invent a set of parameters within which we have an experience. And in a sense, we pretend that those parameters map out a real thing, something with real consequences, though there are none. And we do it all to maximize our enjoyment, our pleasure, our fun. Or take the example of watching a horror movie, a horror film. Oh, it's horrible. Oh, it's scary. Yes, we're tense. We find ourselves gripping the arms of our seat in spite of ourselves. But then why are we watching the darn movie? Well, because it's stimulating, it's titillating, it gives you an experience out of your normal life, providing contrast to that life so as to better appreciate the serenity and lack of real horror in most people's actual reality. The flick kind of gets you excited. It's interesting. Similarly, God does all these horrible things, including the painful and gruesome things of life, because she knows there are no real consequences. He knows there is no actual evil, only seeming ones. There's a part of us who knows there's no permanent harm in anything that ever happens and that sadness and pain are ultimately just experiences to bring out, by contrast, real happiness and pleasure in our life experiences and, as God, to glorify existence by infinitely expanding the manifestations of experience, which is God's essence. Heading, there are only seeming tragedies. Part of that is the notion of death. One of the parameters of this game is this mistaken belief in an end to our experience, our consciousness, our existence. But just as there is no way to end consciousness in no time, there is also no death. And what that means is that ultimately everything is a comedy. Yes, funny God, again. There is no tragedy. There are just seeming tragedies. Heading, those butterfly eyes. My friend Peter Melton from Extinction Radio, Activate Media, talks about this phenomenon of being aware of your immortality while still alive as having your butterfly eyes. 
That is, while one is still the caterpillar. Clearly, he is saying that a caterpillar with butterfly eyes knows that it is not going to die when it stops being a caterpillar. It's, it's going to become something greater. It is going to transform. He is making the analogy that some humans, too, might have butterfly eyes in realizing also that there is no death or ending of consciousness, only transformation, only changes of states, status, or dimensions, as quantum physicists are beginning to say. To that I add that, yes, there is no death, only transformation. But the way I picture is that when we do die, when we become that butterfly and we realize our immortality and look back at our lives, we're laughing our butts off. We're thinking, man, that was a trip. That is, that is another reason why I call it funny God. For what I am saying is that the thing that we share with the divine is laughter. Why? Because it is like we, as God, but thinking we are human, are constantly goofing on ourselves, forever playing this game of divine peekaboo. You know, like we are constantly scaring ourselves with the things we bring to ourselves in life, the experiences we have. But then at some point, and maybe for some especially tragic events in our lives, it can only happen after death, it comes to us. There was no reason to fear. We think, there's no problem, it's fine. How many times has that happened in your life, you know? How many times have you thought something was horrible and never ending and that your life was irreparably changed and then all of a sudden the clouds part, the sun shines through and you're happy again and you go, wow, okay, that was all just to get me here. Suddenly, all that we abhor has meaning for we see what part it played in our becoming who we are. Sometimes we can even acknowledge that if it had been us creating a plan to get us to where we needed to go as a person, to learn and become what we needed to, we might ourselves have chosen those same events for ourselves. We did, by the way. We see a pattern in our lives that is meaningful. Indeed, we see it all as perfect. Of course, no one sees that for all the experiences of their lives, except maybe the truly enlightened folks. Some of us are left causing us anguish when we think of them, and we do not see any meaning in the pain that happened or any benefit in them toward making us a better person or anything. Still, remember that many of the painful experiences of our lives did not reveal their meaning or value to us for a long time, sometimes decades, sometimes not till the end of our lives. We needed to learn more. We needed to have other experiences to get us to a place where we would be able to understand their meaning. I am asking you to entertain the idea that for those events of which we can fathom no meaning or value. There will be revealed exactly that in some time beyond this time, after death. Therein we have those butterfly eyes. We see death as a transformation that makes sense of our lives. We view it as the event after which we become all happily zigzagging, butterfly-like, leaving behind a plodding and slow self, which we now see to be dull, dim-witted by comparison, and thoroughly not getting it. Though the truth was only a membrane, an instant experience of death, or in the case of the caterpillar, a cocoon experience away. Heading, how Gilgamesh misunderstood his breadcrumbs. In fact, I have used the analogy of the butterfly myself in writing about death and immortality. In Funny God, I wrote about the story of Gilgamesh and how we completely got that story wrong. Gilgamesh was looking for his immortality, and their traditional understanding is that there was none to get, and that instead one should focus on the projects of one's life that will live on after them. Totally wrong. No, Gilgamesh actually got the immortality he desired. Rather, he had it all along, and the forces in his story... Today we would say the universe, the all that is, or God. These forces in the story tried to get him to see that. Oh, it was a tragedy for sure. Traditionalists got that right, though in the wrong way. For the tragedy was not that he failed to achieve immortality, but that he did not realize that he had it all along and could not possibly even lose it. How did the universe do that? Well, it showed him a snake slithering away from a skin that it had shed. Now, a snake shedding its skin is a symbol of immortality because it is kind of like when we have a life and we die, supposedly, it is like the shedding of a skin. We just go into another form, and the thing that we leave behind is the corpse, the skin. What I was saying in Funny God is we look at the corpse slash skin, and we say, oh, he's dead, he's gone, you know, the person's gone. But it is only because we cannot see the new snake that remains. We cannot see what the deceased person has transformed into. From the perspective of cater caterpillars as regards butterflies, you can just imagine the caterpillars hanging out, and this one caterpillar is making its cocoon, and the friends 
a busy caterpillar are going, ah, he's going to die. He caught that cocoon-making malady we're seeing so much of these days. He's going to be gone. She's going to be gone. She's making her coffin. Ah, too bad. And why? Because they don't see the butterfly that emerges later. You could imagine that they, like us, do not have it within their species-determined perception set to see it. The butterfly might as well be invisible, a ghost. The caterpillars do not know what happens after a cocoon comes and spirits their friend away. They don't have their own butterfly eyes, if you will, so they don't know. They think it's the end. Now, wouldn't that make them a lot like us? After all, we only see the things that we are programmed to see. If we are not used to seeing butterflies, so to speak, we are only going to see dead caterpillars and coffins or cocoons. So we are convinced there is an end to consciousness at death. But there are people now, at this stage in history, with advanced medical technology making possible ever more instances of people being brought back to life after clinical death who have found their butterfly eyes. There are people who have had near-death experiences, NDEs, as well as death experiences, DDEs, as one of my friends who experienced it insists it should be called, who are aware of and indeed are in ongoing contact with people in the no-form state. There are others... There are legitimate mediums, in fact, who are aware of people in that other dimension and can even communicate with them. Still others, whose special gift is unaccounted for, have back and forth communication with those who have passed on, usually close relatives, spouses, or friends. The instances of such occurring that I am personally aware of are so astonishing that I am wary of telling of them, lest I lose any credibility I might have left. Perhaps another time, perhaps it will be a book. Put simply, these folks can tell you about the deceased. They're not gone. They are simply in a different place. One deceased man told his distraught wife in a vision, Why do you grieve? It is only like I have gone into the next room. As I said earlier, some ideas coming out of quantum physics is that death is about going into another dimension. My own grandmother told a story almost exactly like that throughout her life about her own daughter who passed away as a child appearing to her to comfort her. So the dead are alive. They're here, in a sense, just that we can't see them, just like those caterpillars can't see the butterflies. Heading, then, is earth life unimportant? How I think this all fits together with the extinction thing thing, is that I believe we are being spurred to these realizations by the fact that it is so important that all our focus becomes on this lifetime to get it right, to get right what in other lifetimes we did not. As I said, my generation and I have been trying to get it right since the 60s. Even for things that have been wrong for thousands of years, we wanted to see if we could get it right. And we're still trying to. But anyway, as an entire globe now, we're trying to get it right or else. What I am saying is that part of that death as an ally thing with annihilation on our doorstep is that we are having these realizations, profound realizations of all kinds, unlike anything before, Indeed, only possible now. And some of us are realizing our butterfly eyes while we're still the caterpillar, okay? More and more of us are realizing we are immortal. Heading, our higher self abhors unnecessary pain and suffering. It is compassion and love. Now, does that make it like, oh, it doesn't matter if the life on earth goes away, like, there is no death, so what's the problem? Just drive drive it till the wheels fall off. It doesn't matter if everybody dies. No, because also our higher self, our immortal and divine self, interwoven as it is with our deeper human nature, is also our compassionate self. It is love. And of course, as love, we don't want suffering, unnecessary suffering we detest the most. So since we don't want suffering, death is still not a good thing because it's a painful thing. Heading, our higher self abhors Murder. I mean, death could be fine. It could be just a transition. It could be a graduation. But when it is something to happen for billions of people, and if it is going to happen for 500 million species, it's no longer just, oh, I'm accepting death. I'm just all spiritual and above all such concerns. No, it's freaking murder. Murder on a scale beyond our wildest imaginings. Now, I personally do not want to go into the afterlife or into the no-form state with that on my mind. I don't want to spend my no-formity knowing that I was part of the murder of an entire planet because I didn't do anything to help at the time. Do you? 
So I think that, yeah, we realize we're actually free from death. There's nothing to worry about in that respect. But at the same time, knowing that brings out our higher self to want to make this story, this life, the best one that could be. The one in which we have contributed most to reducing the inherent suffering of life. And not one where we have aided in the near infinite magnification of that suffering throughout humanity, across all species, and for all we know, for multitudes of unknown beings. Yeah, I think the second possibility to be a bad thing. But to aid us in making the right decision, we have our deeper human nature filling us with compassion, with love and compassion. And with that in us, we cannot help but align ourselves with the forces on earth working for life, for sustainability, for stopping the out-of-control extinction. We are compelled to do everything in our power, now or never. In an on-air comment, Peter Melton phrased it quite well indeed this way. Understanding the urgency. Our culture is so death and grief phobic. The emergency will bring that out in you. We think those are bad feelings to have. But what we're becoming to remember, slowly but surely, is that those things will spark this new aspect, this grander aspect of humanity. Is that this remembering is that it is temporary for us individually and that, that that sparks us to live more passionately. You see, we have been taught that human nature is riddled with aggression, competition, selfishness, even murder, and all kinds of other hunter-like and patriarchal qualities. However, truly, even more basically, below the pain or prior to the pain, our actual human nature, which we share with many of our planet mate relatives, by the way, see Planet Mates 2014, brims with love, is cooperative, self-sacrificing, empathetic of others, and divinely beautiful. And that's linked in with the necessary hero. Heading, it's all in you and up to you. We are going into a stage in history, hopefully not an all too short one, where we will be heroic people who are going to do incredible things and make a grand story, or else we're not. In which case, we're going to be some footnote in the universal registry. You can imagine beings of the future zipping by the planet, its epitaph reading, stupid ape. Or like the gods laughing at us now, they will be or have been entertained spectators of our trials and tribulations. A horror story for them, nay, a disaster movie. Sadly, not a good one, though. One and a half stars. Lousy ending. Nobody lived. Hell, they even killed off the heroes. Who does that? No sequel, that's for sure. However, what I believe is actually going to happen in these times is this. People like you, you wounded deer, you centaurs, are going to reconnect with your deepest and most beautiful human nature and be redeemed and freed from conflict and petty strife. You necessary heroes are not going to shirk doing self-sacrificing things. You may very well perform acts of pure heroism, knowing that all else, all life, depends on it. And together we are going to be lifted up into the grandest and most fulfilling cause this world has ever seen. It's all in you and up to you.